A hearty welcome to the twelve tribes scattered abroad and to those grafted in. This is the Israelite in America, and today I wanted to take a look, a brief look, um, into some of the North African Jews. Um, if this sounds interesting to you, give a subscribe, a like, and tell me what you think. Uh, I see, you know, other he Hebrew Israelites um, talking a lot about West Africa, which is great. And uh, even some, you know, some talk about Mid-Africa and occasionally um, East Africa. Haven't seen a lot of discussion on North Africa. And I think it's because a lot of the information is not quite as readily available for some reason. I think there's there's less history um, or our less preserved history in certain regards, certain regards uh, of Jews' existence and history in, in North Africa, in certain parts of North Africa, than there is in about West Africa. But that could just be me. Uh, anyway, let's go ahead and get into this. All right, first off, I want to just give a, a brief overlay, overlook of where we'll be kind of focusing on. Um, and again, this isn't going to be highly extensive, but I, I I do want to share some information with you guys. So right here, we have uh, Tunisia, Libya right there, Algeria. We're not really going to be talking about our Algeria, more Tunisia and Libya. And there you can see, a, um, <clears throat> excuse me, where it's, uh, where a better idea of its location in, you know, Africa itself, uh, a zoomed out view, I mean. So we got Tunis there, the capital, capital city. And um, if we go to a, another map over here, all right, there, this map shows Carthage um, and uh, Libya again there. So you guys, and interesting, <laughs> one day we'll get, we'll touch on the, we'll touch on the Spanish Jews, not today, but um, one day. And then we, we've got, here's a, a better zoomed out idea, just so you guys know where we're kind of going to be, be talking about a little bit. So you have the visual representation. All right. So the first source I want to look at here, uh, this is called Jews in an Arab land. Okay. We'll go to the title here so you guys can see Jews in an Arab land, Libya, 1835 to, through 1970. And the author's name is Renzo Di Felice. And here's a here's a picture of him. This is what he looks like. He's not an, an Israelite. As you guys can see, this is a European. So, because I know some people are, just get hung up when it comes to this color, the skin color, the skin color of, of certain sources. Okay. Um, and this book, let me see. Again, the dates here for this book. Not the publication, but the 1835 through 1970s, I think. Uh, uh, hold on here. Okay, so the first edition was 1985. That's what I was looking for to show you guys. So, and again, we're not going to go through, obviously not going to go through this whole whole book. But, if I can just get down here. Okay. All right, so this guy says... The presence of Jews in Libya goes so far back into time that the historian Ismail Khamilai, I know I'm butchering that name, claims that their origins merge with those of the oldest inhabitants of the country. <clears throat> so, first first sentence right there. Um, if you guys haven't watched my previous videos on, on black Israel and migrations and whatnot, go watch those. I'll, I'll link a card here. Um, but remember, Israel had been, Israelites had been going into North Africa specifically for time out of mind, way back into before there was Israel and there was just Abraham as a Hebrew going into North Africa, Egypt, long time. They, um, so this, this sentence right here is corroborated by other history and the Bible itself. Uh, allusions to Libyan Jews occur in Herodotus and Strabo, and it has been and it has even been asserted, excuse me, it has even been asserted that Jews established themselves in the hinterland region of Jebel Akhdar shortly after, and as a result of the destruction of the first temple in Jerusalem. Okay, this is true. Those of you that have seen uh, my previous series, you know, you know this already. The first fairly reliable information attesting to the presence of Jews on the coast of Tripolitania comes down to us from Carth Carthaginian times documentation from the roman period is more extensive and exact 
At that time, a flourishing Jewish community, which enjoyed close relations with Rome and special privileges granted by Augustus, existed in uh, Tripolitania. The Jewish presence in Cy Cyrenaica can be claimed with certainty from not long after the reign of Ptolemy I in the 3rd century BC. It was in, Cy <clears throat> excuse me, it was in Cy Cyrenaica that Jews were more numerous and active. The first settlements, settlements there, which were more or less sporadic and usually related to trading, were followed by others after the campaigns of Antiochus Epiphanes, uh, 177 to 163 BC. Okay, now, again, right here, this right here, I encourage you guys again to read um, From Babylon to Timbuktu by Rudolf Windsor. He touches, well, actually more than touches on a lot of this. Um, there's there's documented history, and this is this is backing it up. Rudolf Windsor talks about how Jews, Israelites, I, I should, I shouldn't, I should, I, I need to be specific here, Jews and Israelites, but you know what I mean, Jews are Israelites. Anyway, that Israelites had been trading, have been trading up through Africa for, for time out of mind, up on, on, from East Africa, North Africa, they've been, they established trading posts, they've been trading with Hamites and other peoples, it was, they were very good at being uh, traders and merchants. And this guy is just backing this up. So this is, again, we have several witnesses, different witnesses, accounts of this history. Uh, okay, one of the refugees from these wars was Jason of Cyrene, an eyewitness historian of the wars of the Maccabees. As even Joseph, Josephus Flavius tells us, Cyrene became the focus of this settlement and witnessed intense Jewish arist artistic excuse me, and cultural life. New settlements arose after the Roman conquest of Jerusalem in A.D. 70. It was not by chance, then, that Cyrene became the center from which the Jewish revolt against Trajan, then occupied, then occupied, fighting the Parthians of the east, began in about 115, spreading to Cyprus, Egypt, and several places in the east. Um, this revolt, which lasted until 117, had disastrous consequences for the Jews. Okay, listen now. Roman repression reduced the flourishing community of Cyrene to insignificance and set it on the road to inevitable decline. Many of the surviving Jews abandoned the city and took refuge among the Berber tribes of Citer. Or Citre. I think Citer. I, 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 hey, you, you, you uh, masters of pronunciation, <laughs> you gotta forgive me. According to certain Arab historians, they founded a new coastal city, al Yahuda. Interestingly enough, again, now people would say, oh, that, remember what people said about the kingdom of Judah on West Af in the West African coast, okay, and, oh, it has nothing to do with Jews, oh, just, just because it's Judah, it has nothing to do with Jews, that's what they always say. They would likely say the same thing for this, but you see the same similarity in the names, right? al Yahuda. Now, uh, clearly there seems to be some Arabic influence uh, coming in here, but again, al Yahuda is, what is that, Yehuda, Judah? I'm just saying, people, what are people going to say about that, too? Probably say it was false. Uh, they founded a new coastal city, al Yehuda, the remains of which have not yet been discovered. Some fled into the Sahara and westward to Tripoli Tripolitania, Tunisia, Algeria, and Morocco. Okay, all, again, this is all, these are all north, in North Africa. But notice them fleeing west. They're always going deeper in West Africa uh, after the Romans and the Romans. Because remember just how vast the Roman kingdom, the Roman Empire was. Uh, it doesn't make sense that people that looked like Africans, like Hamites, would go in mass. I'm not saying not a few. I'm not saying a few didn't. Not saying that. But it doesn't make sense that people that are trying to hide from an empire that looks, that is white, Okay, it doesn't make sense that they go deeper into that empire's control. They're going to go where they can blend into the native population and where that, that particular empire has less control. Um, among some Berber tribes, these refugees set off a process of Juda Judaization. Okay, in many respects, it was a reciprocal process. Okay, so now in reciprocal process, I take this to mean a couple different things. I take this to mean um, that not only did they uh impart their religion their beliefs onto the berbers i also take this to to me because and, and scripture backs it up that the berbers also uh influenced the jews and well they we know they did but 
Berbers influenced the Jews not only in uh, re religiously but also in their way of life. And we'll see that the Berb that the, a lot of these Jews that were that mingled with the Berbers took on a lot of um, customs and culture from the Berbers. All right, scholars such as Simon have maintained, however, that when the Arabs occupied Libya, the real Jews uh, note this now. The real Jews had probably almost completely disappeared. By then, there were only Christians and Judeo-Berbers. So notice that this is saying that by the time, right, The because the, remember, the, we, we have to keep remembering when uh, Islam, Mohammedanism was sweeping through Africa and, and you didn't, it would, uh, after the Romans and such, you had the, the Muslim conquest. We have to keep this in mind. So this is saying, uh, and other people have touched on this, that the real Jews by this time had fled. They had largely left this particular area. Where did they go? Well, we know that they went deeper west, <clears throat> excuse me, deeper into West Africa, deeper into uh, heading towards South Africa, deeper into Central Africa. We know that that's where they went, fleeing uh, the, the persecution that was coming from all these different fronts. Um, but notice that there, this, this, uh, this mentions Judeo Berbers, right? So, uh, Berbers that weren't Jews by blood, weren't Israelites by blood, by blood, but that had certain Jew, uh, Jewish, uh, I don't want to use that word, um, Israelite, certain Israelite customs and, 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 uh, uh, habits and even beliefs. Okay. But, uh, who were the Berbers? Let's, I know, I know that you guys, most of you guys know this, but I know that there's some who, who are less familiar. So let's, let me, we have a brief definition here. This is from uh, Britannica.com. I know some of you guys are familiar with that. Now, um, this is, okay, There, the definition here, Berber. Berber. Oh, let me go down. Self-name, Amisich. I, again, you pronunciation expert, experts, you got to forgive my mispronunciation. Um, plural, Amaz, Amazichin. Any of the descendants, listen, listen, of the pre-Arab inhabitants of North Africa. This is important. The Berbers live in scattered communities across Morocco, Algeria, Tunisia, Libya, Egypt, Mali, Niger, and Mauritania. They speak various Amazigh languages belonging to the Afro-Asiatic family related to ancient Egyptian. Okay, so we have a definition of the Berbers, and I know, I know a lot of you guys... Uh, picture a certain thing when when you when somebody says Berbers, there's a certain picture that comes in our minds, and we're gonna we'll address that um a, a little in a little bit, but I just wanted to get this definition in in at the forefront of our minds here, okay? Because this is important. Uh, we we talked about or have mentioned again the Arab invasion. We've got to keep these things in mind because when a lot a lot of us think of Berbers, we just automatically think you know um uh, oh you know, Muslims, Muslims, that's uh, members of the Ottoman Empire, even that's what we fit. That is what a lot of people just automatically think of. But we have to keep in mind that this right here is telling us that it's any of the descendants of the pre Arab inhabitants of North Africa. So before the Arabs ever came along, this is what we've got to keep in mind. All right. Now, I did want to take a look at something a little interesting that I came across this and I thought it was interesting. Um, uh, this is about uh, Kahina, all right, priestess and queen of Carthage, who was a powerful and ruthless leader of the Berber tribes of northern Africa. All right, the name variations: Kahina, Daba the Kahina, Daya. It goes on. I'm not going to butcher all of those. Uh, reigned between six six ninety five and seven hundred three C.E. Uh, okay. Around the time of the capture of Carthage by the Arabs, again, again, got, got to keep this in mind, guys, the Arab, Arab conquest, got to keep that in mind. The normally pastoral Berber tribes of the Atlas Mountains of North Africa rallied under the leadership of Queen Kahina, a powerful black Jew, black Jew, known variously as Deheya, Kahina, or Kaheya. There's that Ya in that name, just... That's an interesting point. Who was also said to be a prophet. We don't know if this is accurate or not. You know, people say stuff. Who who knows? 
Gathering Christians as well as Jews into a powerful army, Kahina led her tribes in an attack against the Arabs who were led by Hassan ibn al-Numan, an Arab prince of Egypt. Uh, successful in driving the Arabs back to Egypt, Kahina remained queen over a large region of North Africa for the next five years while Prince Hassan planned his revenge. Hoping to ward off another attack, Kahina laid waste to her lands, ordering all the Berber cities destroyed, the gold and silver buried, and even the fruit trees cut down, leaving a desert. Um, I got to, got to say right here, you see what happens when you don't follow Torah? See what happens when you don't follow, when you don't follow the law? Um, the Most High said, hey, don't cut down the fruit trees in the land. This is in Torah. Do not cut down the fruit trees. Cut down the, the non-fruit bearing trees in war. Don't cut the fruit trees down. That's, that's food. And you see what, see what happens? Because uh, obviously they wouldn't be keeping things properly, being uh, in exile and and having fled Jerusalem. Unfortunately, her tactics succeeded only in impoverishing her people, I'm sure, and did nothing to dissuade Hassan. Around 705 CE, when the Arabs attacked again, Queen Kahina was either killed in battle or beheaded, and the Berbers ultimately became allies with the Arabs, which is how, <laughs> which ultimately ultimately led to where we are today. All right, now, I just thought that was interesting, an interesting note. And uh, we'll have another mention of Queen Kahina. Some people say that it was a fable that Queen Kahina never actually existed, but there seems to be uh, certain evidence to suggest that she did. Um, now, evidence, um, full-scale information is a little scant on her, but it does exist. Um, and I think we have some more on it a little later in this presentation. Another source I wanted to look at. This is travel. <clears throat> excuse me, travels in North Africa by Nahum Schloss. <laughs> uh, I'm I'm sorry. <laughs> this is on the Internet Archive, um, archive.org. Oh, and let me give you the website of this other one. This is Encyclopedia.com. I will put links to the sources in the description. I think YouTube has uh, has uh, allowed my link, links to be clickable finally. So I will put the links in the description so you guys can click them, check them out yourself. So this is from encyclopedia.com and this is from archive.org. And this is the author right here on this far side. Let me see if I can. Okay. Yeah. This is the author right here. I'm sorry. Kind of got some Colonel Sanders action going on. <laughs> oh, we got to keep it light. That's the author right there. That's Nahum Schultz. Um, so, Again, for people that are, well, you you only use, you know, people that are black for your sources. There, there you go. So this is from Travels in North Africa. Uh, but the interest of the Jewish reader will not be confined to Phoenician or Punic Carthage. Roman Carthage is a veritable storehouse for the Jewish historian. We need only mention Hamam El Lif, Hamam El Lif, a watering place close to Tunis, where the ruins of a synagogue of the Roman epoch have been rediscovered. The Cape of Gamart, where a large Jewish necropolis of an individual character was discovered by Father Delater, Delatry, not sure. And then, the, and then there are numerous inscriptions, Hebrew and Latin, scattered throughout the whole of the district, which bear witness to the importance of the Jewish community of Carthage in Roman times. Okay, now Carthage was an ancient city. We hold on. Where's the map here? Right here. There's there's Carthage, and I'll I'll pull up. We'll have something on Carthage very very uh, quickly here in the in a moment. Um, so don't worry. I know most of you guys know what know about Carthage, but I'll we'll we'll, we'll address it in, ju in just a second. Uh, in, in Roman times. Okay, it continues on. In previous historical essays, the writer has treated of the persistent traditions in this country of a glorious Jewish past, traditions attached to the Judeo-Berber race, which, century after century, held out against the Romans and the Arabs. Okay, so they were, again, we back up, we back up our, our history, our, our assertions of history with m multiple sources. We don't just use one Okay, we, we, we corroborate with the Bible and, and history, and we use more than just one source. So, this is, again, as we look, as we saw in our other source, um, Jews in Arab Libya, Jews in Arab land, Libya, 
Okay, this this uh, other source here is again confirming the fact of the of Israelite occupation existence in North Africa among the Berbers for not just a few years and not just not simply bound to when they fled um, the Babylonians or the Romans. Okay, they had been there. Um, it was it goes on. It was in the seventh century that this race of Bahazu, Bahuzim or Jewish nomad warriors, rose in the desert under the leadership of the great Jewish queen Daya, or Damia el Kahina. Okay, there was there's a second second witness there. The priestess, celebrated for her beauty, uh, oh, excuse me, that was all right. Uh, celebrated for her beauty, her wisdom, and her heroism. A legendary halo has gathered around this woman, to whom French scholars have given the name the African Joan of Arc. <laughs> to the writer, Daya El Kahina seems the greatest woman in history. Now, I mean, yes, she. This is me personally talking. Yes, yeah, she. She seems seems uh, great and all. That was great to repel the invasion, but cutting down the fruit trees and destroying your cities doesn't doesn't make much sense to me. Seems a more accurate description um, based on on the knowledge that we have of her, that she was maybe more like a Boudicca type situation. Um, that would be more a similar thing. Um, common if you know about the story of Boudicca. Uh, let me know. All right, uh, let's continue. But not only do memorials of the glori glorious Jewish past, which has survived in legend and inscription, fascinate the Jewish student, the present and perhaps even the future of the Jews of this country mean even more to him. Tunis is neither Arab nor European, writes Guy de Maupassant. Tunis is, more than anything else, a Jewish city, and nowhere else are the Jews as much at home as in Tunis. Again, um, Rudolf Windsor addresses this. And indeed, <clears throat> excuse me, and indeed, Tunis, the inheritor of Hebrew Carthage, is the eternal city of the Jews, for like the phoenix... For like the phoenix, the Jews have risen again and again out of the ashes of their destruction. After the sacking of Carthage, the Jews were found again in Carthage under Roman domination. After the Byzantine per uh, persecutions, they fled into the desert, taking refuge there with their free brethren, only to return with the Jewish queen, the Kahina, at their head. And even now, <clears throat> excuse me, and even, and even. Under the persecution of the Arabs, the Jews somehow managed to survive catastrophe after catastrophe. Yes, they did, because he said that the Most High said he wouldn't utterly forsake us. He wouldn't utterly throw us aside. We would be chastened. Um, we would be led into all lands. Um, fear and, and, and famine and danger and the sword would pursue us, but he wouldn't utterly forsake us. So we, we, we still retain... Um, our survival. <laughs> Interesting way of saying it. We, we still retain survival, our survival, despite all the affliction and persecution that happens to us no matter where we go. So this is all, and, and again, it, he, he mentions um, them fleeing. <clears throat> Excuse me. Yes, some fled into the desert, but oh, again, we also know that uh, those, they fled, uh, many fled further south, further west, and to, deeper into Africa. This all all this connects with previous document uh previous my previous presentations, excuse me, and and just bolsters what myself and, and others with more knowledge than me have been saying. Okay, history we can show we can point to places in history that tell of our of, of the of Israelite travels, migrations, Israelite flight, where we went, um, what happened there and then that bears record okay certain other people who shall here remain unnamed certain other people are just like oh well scythians vanished um they they just vanished they just disappeared out of history oh ashkenaz oh man they, they just vanished uh, we just took the name and they just vanished oh so and so they just disappeared it, it, it was just gone oh that those people that city that place oh it just it just vanished and yet when we show history uh, documented history, books, resources, maps. Oh, well, that doesn't prove anything. <sighs> anyway, moving on. Uh, Carthage. 
and we're just going to get we're just going to I'm I'm only going to read this first part right here. You can research Carthage on your own time. I'm sure it will come up again in in other presentations that we do in the future. And yes, this is Wikipedia. Guys, I'm not using Wikipedia to for theological and 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 to prove the existence of God and and on all this stuff. Okay? This first paragraph here is is for informational purposes. Yes, you can use Wikipedia check the sources do not just use wikipedia and just take what it says check the sources but it can be used it is a useful tool now ancient carthage was an ancient semitic civilization centered in north africa did you guys catch that semitic civilization centered in north africa okay up in here Semitic. How often do we hear about Semitic civilizations in, in Africa? Comment below. How often have you, any of you guys heard people talking about uh, Shemites in Africa? Because I haven't heard very many, and that could just be me. Uh, initially, a settlement in present-day Tunisia, it later became a city-state and then an empire. Founded by the Phoenicians in the 9th, 9th century BC, we're not going to get into that right now. Carthage reached its height in the 4th century BC as one of the largest um, metropolises in the world and the center of the Carthaginian Empire. <clears throat> or Carth yeah, Carthaginian Empire. A major power in the ancient world that dominated the western and central Mediterranean Sea. Following the Punic Wars, Carthage was destroyed by the Romans in 146 BC, who later rebuilt the city lavishly. Now, keep in mind, Sh again, Shemites, a Shemitic civilization. Yes, I know. I can hear people saying, "Well, that doesn't mean there were just Shemites there." I'm not saying there were only Shemites there, but it is. It was a founded Shemite, uh, Sh Sh Semitic empire. Okay, so Shemites in North Africa. Okay, <laughs> what did these people look like? Do you think? Hmm? Because remember mi the mixing, uh, 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 the the change in skin color of the people that we the people that we see over there today in 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 a lot of parts of North Africa was not the original skin color. You had Greek, Roman, and then Arab invasions. What did these people originally look like? What did these Shemites look like? What did these Berbers look like? Amongst whom the 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 Israelites hid, and uh, amongst whom the Israelites hid, right? What did they look like? Okay, this is an article from uh, facetofaceafrica.com. Again, I will post the links. Um, and this is entitled, "Do you know what North Africans looked like before Islam and Arabs invaded?" Uh, this is an article from 2019. Okay, because if we if if you think of, a, of of north africans today specifically moroccans and um you know and berbers in egypt and such we kind of get a picture of people that look like this hmm people that, people that look like this and a lot of people that look like this are in fact over there right now right a berber gentleman right? people that look like this the these are clearly arabs Now, let's let's get a little insight here. Okay, <clears throat> excuse me. There has been a fierce debate over the Africanness of Maghrebian North Africans, uh, as well as Libyans and Egyptians, for close to a century. One of the key drivers of this debate is their appearance. Guys, if if we don't know, if there are people among us that do not know that Libyans were originally, uh, I mean, completely black people complete dark skin black uh, if if there are people among us that that are debating this libyans i there's no hope <laughs> honestly there's no hope man because that means every everything there, there's no hope i won't even go into to that but let's move on and uh, we know that the the egypt debate has been um ongoing because of course we can't have a bunch of completely black dark people building one of the greatest civilizations that ever was on the planet uh, okay uh, one of the key drivers of this debate is their appearance on the eye the majority of north africans would pass for middle easterners or mediterranean europeans yes on a map these groups of people are also close however this similarity in appearance is explainable this adds man 
The climate in, in that part of the world has input into how they look. Okay, now already I can hear people, you know, those people that like to use that. See, we, we you're using climate. We that's what we we've always been saying. Yeah, people turned people went into the to the desert into Israel and, and and they just turned white. Or people were over here, people from Europe came down and and because of the skin and whatnot, they they turned brown. Okay, and that is not that is not what this is saying. This notice the language. The climate in that part of the world has input into how they look. We know that climate does have input into how you look. For instance, if you're in a bunch of sunlight and such, you will tan. Um, I have family in the UK who and black family, of course, that um due to the climate of the UK, where they are, the you know, cold, wet sun not as nowhere near as much as much uh sunshine as over here in the u.s the toning of their skin is there's a difference between the toning of their skin and the toning of my skin <clears throat> excuse me um and they're still black you, you of course can look at them and oh yeah those are 100 percent black people but the toning there is a difference in the toning of their skin versus the toning of, of my skin for instance so separate between climate having an input into how one looks versus climate totally changing one how one looks and and features and hair and everything separate those two all right uh second we'll continue in the article here second because of their pro of their proximity to one another the mixing of their peoples should be natural mm -hmm, there was mixing okay we know there was mixing but that's just the point there was mixing there was mixing, not the original peoples, not the, what is this, what did it say over here in the uh, Britannica Encyclopedia? Any of the descendants of the pre-Arab inhabitants of North Africa. Pre-Arab. Okay. Uh, these two prima facie facts aside, I forget how to pronounce this. Guys, I, I'm on one today. You got to forgive me. Um. There should, however, be little doubt what the peoples of North Africa looked like prior to invasions. Correct. The 6th century Roman poet Corippus, in his book Johannes, describes the Berbers as, I'm going to butcher this too, Fasis Nagroc Caloris. I don't speak uh, <laughs> this language. Which means faces of the black color. How can this get any more, uh, how, how can this be mistaken? Faces of the black color. There should be no mistaking it. Okay, these are pre. This is this is what the Berbers and peoples of North Africa, all the peoples of North Africa, looked like before uh, invasions. Does this look like somebody with the face of black black color? Does this look like someone with a face of black color? You tell me. Um, in the same century, Procopius in book. Four of history of the war of history of the wars discussed the difference between the Vandals who had settled in North Africa and the Moors. Procopius says that the Vandals were not black skinned like the Morusi, like the Morosi, Moors or Morisoi, Morisioi. Good grief, Morisioi, Moors. The tribes he classified as Morisioi are those now described as ancient Berbers. They include the Numidians, and I'm not going to butcher all of these names. You guys can read those for yourselves on the screen. I'm not going to butcher them. Okay, so they were not black-skinned the Vandals. We're not going to get into all this right now. But uh, the, those these people, already different peoples that were coming in to, to North Africa, were not black-skinned like the original inhabitants. They weren't. Uh, Nasir Kusrao. On, uh, uh, oops, excuse me. The page is doing something weird. Must be the ads. Um, an 11th century Iranian also described the Masmuda soldiers of the Fat Fatimid of the Fatimid dynasty as black Africans. So an Iranian, an actual Middle Eastern person, describing, hey, this is what they look like: black Africans, different from what I look like myself. The the the, the Iranian who's writing this, who made this quote, I mean, not this article. But it would take more to convince some of the Africanness of North Africans. Arab, and by extension the Islamic invasion of North Africa, was from around the 6th century, but after Christianity had permeated the region 
for half a millennium. In other words, Europeans. Europeans. Okay, perhaps the criteria that is sought is the same one given to us by our studies of ancient Egypt. And uh, you guys can read the rest of this article in your own time. I'll leave a link. But, of course, uh, mentioning Egypt, because as we know, the big old debate that I already mentioned a little, little while ago about, oh, Egyptians weren't actually black, you know, they were more European. Just nonsense. So, if, now that I, we've established that, A, ancient Berbers would have looked like this, here's some actual images of ancient Berbers that you guys can, can find. These are Berber, Berber women. Okay, notice, notice there's no mistaking the skin color, the big lips, the, the prominent noses. There's no mistaking. Okay, here's another Berber woman. As you see, the, the, the garb is, is similar. We're keeping consist consistency here. Similar garb, all right? Consistency. These are people you can see wandering around the desert. These are who the Jews, the Israelites, that fled into North Africa hid amongst. And guess what? Intermingled with. We've already just established that they were intermingling with these people, exchanging cultures, um, uh, Judaizing these people, and getting benefits in return. So when we so when we when we look at modern day Berbers, modern day Moroccans, people that are up in North Africa now, we have to keep in mind, guys, that this is not what they looked like. This is not what the ancient peoples looked like. Looked like, excuse me. So when people tell you um, that these are the people that were in North Africa since all the... Yo, this guy looks like a Berber Robin Williams. I'm not even going to lie, people. Is this not the Berber, the Moroccan Berber version of Robin Williams? My goodness. Anyway. <laughs> oh, forgive me. Anyway, when people say, hey, these are the people that were that were inhabiting ancient Africa, ancient North Africa, you know, that, this is what the Berbers looked like. This is what Moroccans looked like. You can't tell me that that Jews look, hid amongst these people and looked like uh, 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 when we're black. No, no. And then you show them this and they and, 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 and the history that goes along with it, with these these images, people that look like this and they don't want to talk about it. They don't they they will say, oh, they'll, no, they'll shut it, shut it down. So, again, we have to be able to separate. Climate doesn't <laughs> climate doesn't turn you from this to this. Okay, it just doesn't. Climate, I don't care how hot the sun is, how cold the winter is, climate does not turn you from this to this. Anyway, that's all I've got for you guys today. All right, subscribe. Please subscribe and comment. Share the video with... Uh, uh, someone you might, someone who's mentioned Berbers or, or North African uh, Israelite migration to you before. Share this video and see what they have to say. Um, like I said, it, this was not going to be all that extensive, but I did want to bring those sources out. And again, us reestablish because we always have, to, we're the ones that always have to reestablish what people look like. Nobody else does, but we have to always say, hey, no guys, this is what they look like and fight to to make our voices heard. <laughs> And it's incredible. Anyways, this has been the Israelite in America. Thank you for watching. I will see you in the next one. Bye-bye.